Hello, everyone. My name is Rick Albert, a real estate broker associate with La America Real Estate here in Los Angeles and a real estate investor. And I'm going to let these other gentlemen introduce themselves. John, why don't you go first? Hi, I'm John Kim. I'm a loan officer with Guaranteed Rate. Um, um, my guess, my official headquarters is in Calabasas, but I work in a solid office out of Oxnard. Um, but uh, worked with Rick and uh, Mike a lot. And uh, yeah, it's great to have, uh, you know, be on the call. Thank you. Yeah. Michael, go for it. All right, everybody. I am Michael Izbotsky. I'm a certified financial planner. I work primarily with uh, our millennial generation. So let's say 30s, early 40s. So uh, started my firm a few years back so I could focus on, on that demographic and actually uh, work on things that I feel like are applicable to me as well. So. Um, yeah, I have. Uh, I work like as John. I pretty much work virtually, so I'm based here in Los Angeles, but I do have clients throughout the U.S., but primarily Southern California. But every once in a while, you know, I have some clients who who are uh, even on the East Coast. So happy to be here. Super uh, excited to stock numbers. Yeah. So for those that have watched these before, typically John and I do uh, once a quarter. We talk about the housing market, um, but here we are in December. And things have changed, right? So over the last two years, you've been able to lock in really low interest rates. It was a no-brainer to buy. It was a no-brainer to sell, right? Because, I mean, I remember representing a, a buyer and then I talked to the seller. He's like, I just sold because I saw what the house next door was selling for. And I was like, I want that price. But things have changed. Interest rates have tripled. Homes are you know, taking longer to sell. We're not seeing these mass bidding wars that we used to have and so I wanted Michael on the call with us this time around because we want to talk about what's what's going on today, but then also how do we prepare for 2023? It's going to be a totally different market than we've probably seen in the last 20 years. So why don't we go ahead and jump right into it. From a mortgage perspective, what's going on in the housing market? So in the housing market, what's kind of going on is that rates have just fluctuated so much. And uh, right now, what the Fed is trying to do is they're really trying to slow down the economy because inflation is running red hot. It's basically triple of what it should be. It should be at 2%. Latest numbers is like 7.7% and they need to slow that economy down. And they do that um, by raising their um, their lending rates. Uh, so they already hiked 0.75% four times and they're due to hike another half percent in December and another quarter percent in January. So they're still hiking, but they're trying to um, tapered off um, as inflation cools down. And it has just a little bit. Um, it was at like 9% in June. And uh, latest numbers is like 7.7%. It should be 2%. So even though the numbers are getting better, it's still not great. So uh, at the end of the day, what's going on with rates is that the days of like, you know, 2.75, 3%, those are long gone. Um, rates have basically tripled like today. You know, if you're paying par, meaning you don't pay points uh, to lower the rate, uh, I would probably say it's, you know, sitting around in general, depending upon a lot of different things. But in general, you're probably looking at maybe like mid sixes um, and then jumbos are going to be a little bit higher than that, maybe like uh, a little lower than seven. Um, but points go a long way um, to kind of buy down the rate. That's what most people are opting for. They'll just pay the points. So they can get that done um, and have a lower rate over the 30 years that they have to pay that loan off. Or there's, you know, other products coming out like temporary buy downs um, where you have like introductory rates that are 2% lower in the first year, 1% lower in the next year. Um, and then it goes back to the regular uh, market rate of what it would be today. So at the end of the day, um, affordability has definitely decreased. Um, and you're looking at the grand scheme of things, people who could afford, a $1 million home back in January can probably only afford like, uh, I, I, I had a particular bar. She uh, had to kind of decrease down to like nine ten uh, due to the rise of the interest rates. Um, so, you know, the inflation factor is real when you um, look for a mortgage. Um, and it seems like, uh, you know, people are really starting to pick and choose uh, the mortgages that they want and how to finance that. Can you go a little bit into just briefly what are points and how much they cost? Yeah. So basically points are just basically an upfront fee that you pay to the lender in order to in decrease your rate either temporarily or permanently. So um, let's say 
par pricing, meaning you're not getting paid anything or you don't pay anything uh, in order to get your rate. Like let's just say it's six and a half today. Um, you could put in a couple thousand um, in order to uh, get that rate down to six to five or six percent. Now that amount of money will vary um, depending upon your credit profile. Will vary upon the day and the hour that you know you decide to enter escrow, um, and it fluctuates, right? But uh, right now, what's going on is that a little bit goes a long way. Sometimes it's not worth it. Um, temporary buy downs um, are kind of like this new hot thing where, like I said before, it's just a temporary uh, rate reduction, but it's massive in the first two years. So it's like 2% lower on the first year and then 1% lower in the second year, and it goes back to regular uh, rates. So for example, if it's six and a half today, your first year, you'd only be paying four and a half on year one, five and a half on year two, and it would go back to six and a half uh, for the rest of the time. Now, uh, why do those products are being introduced? It's because the exact same problem that people are having was what they were qualified before, like in January, is not the same as what they could qualify for now because rates have basically tripled. So in order to incentivize buyers to get back into the market, um, sellers sometimes give lender credits, or I'm sorry, seller credits um, in order uh, to, to buy down that rate temporarily. So what people are believing, and the reason why this product is kind of uh, unique and uh, is being introduced more often is because they think that rates will decrease maybe in the long term, maybe like second or third quarter. Um, some people are even predicting it might be like even mid five is by like three, uh, third quarter. Um, but, you know, obviously that nobody knows that answer. Even, not, even the Fed doesn't know. Um, but it seems like inflation is kind of more persistent than even the Fed was thinking was going to happen. Uh, so um, the latest data is basically showing, though, that, you know, the economy is still pretty strong um, and the Fed is going to have uh, more uh, reason to keep that rate schedule in order to combat inflation. So they're in a tough position right now. The Fed has to definitely slow the economy down because, you know, uh, inflation is running so rampant um, that people can't afford much for this, you know, for the same uh, dollar amount. And then, so, so you, that, yeah, go sorry. Rick. All right. So for that two, two on buy down, like is the cost equivalent to buying down just one point or is the cost like, no, you're paying two points worth? Yeah. So it, it, it's the, the formula is a little compli complicated, um, but basically, it's basically like um, what you're doing is you're having the seller put down a sum of money on it. Sure. And then instead of reducing the purchase price, they're getting a seller credit. So on the seller side, what happens is, is that you'll actually net more money with a seller credit of, say, yes. like 15000 versus a price reduction of 15000 So between the two options, a seller is going to want to only do a seller credit. They're not going to do a... a a purchase price reduction. And that number will vary depend upon what kind of program you have. So if it costs 15000 of um, to basically um, make up for the lost interest in those first two years, that's the amount of money that the seller credit should be for. So what they're doing is they're saying, okay, let's say the amount of interest lost uh, for a lender in the first two years comes out to be 15000 because it's artificially deflated 2% and 1%. Mm -hmm. That fifteen thousand will basically, um, uh, what's the, what's the word I'm trying? Will merge mm -hmm. with the the buyer's uh, present mortgage payment, right? So that sum of money is basically held on as a seller credit, and then um, gets it to where it needs to be as if it was six and a half percent the entire time. Now between you and me, um, and everyone watching. <laughs> uh, yeah yeah and everybody watching exactly yeah uh i personally maybe i'm a risk averse person i don't take a lot of risks i'm not that kind of guy i mean there's a lot of people who to do i mean i i didn't really think that it was an option unless uh you knew you were moving very very soon so on average home you know homeowners will will either to get rid of their mortgage or they'll move every seven years right um I would just do a permanent buy down is, is what I would do. Uh, permanent buy downs are all, we're always available. They'll always be available. Um, you can always either accept a higher rate and get a lender credit, meaning money back to you. I've done that. Right. Or you can, you can pay points in order to get that 
rate reduced over the course of 30 years. I'd rather have just the kind of uh, uh, you know peace of mind knowing that my rate is not going to change in the first two years, and I have to you know I, I have to ramp up for it. But it's, on the other on the other case, some people say, hey, listen, if you think that rates are going to decrease, you know, come third quarter. It does make sense, and that that's also a logical argument too. You can always just refinance again if rates take a plummet uh, in like third quarter of twenty twenty three. Got it, Michael. You had a question or a thought? Yeah, it was just thought question. Um, I think John, you might have answered a little bit, but you know, a lot of my clients now just the whole talk this whole year inflation, interest rates, etc. So even last year, I was talking with clients planning helping them to purchase a home. And then almost overnight, interest rates have shot up like three, 4%, it feels like. So when would it actually make sense? Does it make sense to buy points like you see that often? Typically, from what I've heard, I haven't actually sat down and crunched the numbers. Typically, I heard it's generally not necessarily a good idea to do so. So I was just curious what your thoughts were on that. The payback's like five to seven years, right? Point. Yeah, typically, right. So there's kind of like an inflection point. So you can buy down your rate all the way down to five percent, or what? I mean, there's you can there there's a scale, right? There's an economy's a scale to it. There's a point when you put in more money, and then uh, the amount of dollar amount that you actually pay le- is less in in various you know uh, various amounts of difference. So there's going to be a point when you put in a ton of money, and you're just not going to get the amount of savings that you want. So there is an inflection point. Now, it's kind of a combination, like you said, like like I was saying before, is, is your risk-adverse kind of personality or you know risk-seeking personality. For me, like I'd rather know that I had a 30-year fix the entire time at this rate, even if it was more expensive. But I'm not going to do it to a point um, where I'm just throwing my money at the lender on the table and just, you know, saying, take, take all of it, you know, like I'm, what a good lender is going to do is they're going to give you options. And they're going to say, Hey, listen, here's like four different options. You can either buy at par, um, 6.25, 6, 5.75. And this is the amount of money that you would have to pay up front to do that. And this is the amount of money that you're going to save. Um, what this was, this is what your, you know, pity is your, your, uh, principal interest tax insurance will be, um, at these various rates. And then usually people have made that decision for themselves. They say, oh, okay, well, let's go for option two versus option four. That just seems like a waste of money for option four. I, or let's just go with you know par because I'm just going to refinance maybe in six months anyways. So a lot of that question has to do with kind of your personality if, and what you expect the market to do later. Now, a refinance in and of itself you know, is going to cost money. Um, and then usually what lenders do is order to make it a zero dollar transaction, any fees from title escrow and the lender, um, you basically just increase the loan amount to absorb them. So there's not actual cash changed in hand, right? It's all basically virtual. You just increase the loan amount in order to get it to a zero dollar transaction. So if your mortgage if your mortgage was five hundred thousand flat and it costs seven thousand to do a refinance, then your new mortgage loan amount will be five hundred seven thousand. Does it kind of make sense? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. So if you go to five hundred seven thousand, you're actually paying seven thousand dollars more of interest because you're borrowing that money essentially. So knowing that too changes people's perspective and was like, and they're like, well, maybe I shouldn't do a refinance, and then I should just pay the points down now and save that money, right? If I had to do, if I had to put seven thousand into it, I might as well just put seven thousand into the points now so I can avoid a refinance in the future. So. It's a conversation, and there's a lot of things to think about, and a lot of it has to do with personality. I would say today, loans that are closing are people are usually buying points, They're not going nuts or anything like that. It's you know maybe like 0.75 or one point. I mean, I've never seen anybody go like above two. Like, it can get astronomically expensive, and your benefit um, on economies of scale will decrease significantly the more money you put into it so you know it's it's best to be kind of reasonable um and to think that you know the market's not gonna shift like unless there's like a another war in ukraine right like uh you know they're like some china gets a you know taiwan gets attacked or something like that um we should expect that 
the markets have already priced in kind of the Fed schedule, and we're kind of at a point when um, interest rates are kind of stabilizing at this point. Uh, real quick on this two one program, I'm as, I'm making the assumption. I just want to confirm that the borrower is qualifying based off the highest point of interest rate. Yes, sir. You're there. That's a good point. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. So it's not like they're going to qualify at the four and a half percent interest rate. They're going to qualify at the six and a half. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that's actually a really good segue too, because you know, there's you know, people are looking at arms too, mm -hmm. and um, just to let the yeah general public know is that. Arms, if you take the same loan amount, same credit profile, if everything remains the same, an ARM uh, qualification number, your pre-approval number, will be much less than that if you just do a 30-year fix. For the exact same reason. is because for an ARM, it has the ability to fluctuate. Mm -hmm. Lenders will be more conservative, and they'll take kind of like uh, the current rate plus 2% to see if you make, make a payment just in case rates go nuts. Right. So you're exactly right. It's going to qualify you based upon what the current market is before those first two years. Which then goes into because my concern always is like, well, what happened in 2008 was people were getting loans they didn't qualify for. So like, here's a two one two years from now. <laughs> it's like, well, I can't refinance. I can't sell. What do I do? But then to your point, if they're already qualifying at that higher interest rate, in theory, as long as they haven't had a major job fluctuation, they should still be able to afford those payments. This is yeah, yeah, you're 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 spot on. Like yeah. uh I don't I feel like <laughs> I feel like FHA, Fannie Mae, those guys, they like that's always on their mind and they're yeah. always thinking about risk and avoiding an OA crisis. If there's ever a housing market crisis, I would have to I would I would really bet my house that it would never be because of you know loose lending practices. The amount of scrutiny and thought that goes behind making sure somebody can qualify um, is just enormous. It's, it's, it's the number one thing on everybody's mind. It's why people get frustrated when they say they can't get qualified for more when they say, you know, I actually make this, but on paper you make this. Um, it's only what you can prove, not what the actual thing, you know, what you're, what's actually happening um, in, in real life. So anything undocumented, like undocumented rents or you know, you have the side business, but it's been less than two years that you've worked this side business. Um, you know, those are things that us as lenders have to really scrutinize and make sure that that income is stable and can be counted. It's kind of the general rule of thumb. We have to prove three years of continuance, uh, continuance of income in order to ensure that that income can be counted on a file, right? So, so it's what separates good loan officers from bad ones. To be honest with you, it's how well you know your income. If if you say a borrower, ha you know, can qualify for more because there's a, a side job that they have, you got to be right because otherwise that loan will fail. Okay. Uh, Michael, do you have any other questions? Are you ready to? I, I do have one. I just, Go so for I it. might touch on this later, but I know, I know um, John was talking about risk averse versus more risk tolerant. So I've, I've had conversations with my clients who are a little bit more keen on taking some risk not like an absurd like absurd amount but we've had conversations recently like does it make sense to lock in an arm or versus the traditional you know 30 year fixed and it was interesting to hear john say and i think rick you actually brought up first meaning like if if the adjustable rate is four percent you still have to be approved like you will be approved based on a six percent interest rate right is that pretty much how it works Exactly. Yeah, so, you're exactly right. They'll artificially inflate it and they'll say, hey, listen, worst case scenario, this rate could go up to like 6% if it's actually 4 in the introductory rate. You're exactly right. Okay. Yeah, no, I just, it was more of a comment, I guess. So like, it's one thing I've been, you know, I have a few few clients who are, you know, starting. It's always the talk, right? It's like, do we buy now? Do we wait? Et cetera. Like interest rates are crazy. So I'm, we're trying to get, I'm sure you guys are both trying to get a little bit more creative than when it was years ago when it was in the twos so it, it's just interesting you said that so essentially if if a client can qualify for five hundred thousand dollars at seven percent then they have the option of going you know the adjustable rate mortgage right and then just lowering that monthly payment yeah and it's super specific to that person right <laughs> like sometimes someone's qualified for much more than they're willing to than they're willing to tolerate right like Oh yeah, you know, absolutely. Yeah. People rarely go to their max pre-approval amount too, and I'm sure Rick has kind of like a um, you know, uh, an opinion upon this. And the question is like, do you wait or do you buy now? Um, there's a 
pretty much objective data all over uh, the Fed's websites about interest rates and home prices and how those two interact. With upcoming recessions, which all the big CEOs and the big banks are thinking is going to happen in 2023, home prices rarely decrease that much, even through recession times. Um, for the most part, they are they go down a little or hold stable. And especially in Los Angeles, this is one of the most, um, you know, you know, the the market for home homes are just it's just insane, right? It's pretty much not the the rest of the country is not as insulated as LA as LA County is what I would say, right? So um, Rick could probably talk about this a lot better than me, yeah. but um, it, it, yeah, you jump into that, right? You you'll know probably have more educated answers yeah, about I, that. So so let's talk about what's going on in the market right now. So I did pull up some data here. Um, the problem is. We're, we're in this weird time because it's not just this pending recession or if we're in a recession or whatever we want to define it, but we also have seasonality, right? Home prices tend to go down in December because it's a holiday season. So it's really tough to say. It's like, well, what are we seeing? So right now, the average price in LA County is at $810,000, which has been on the decline over the last couple of months, right? From the height out of almost about 900000 but there's also less homes on the market. There's less buyers out there. Um, but on the flip side, I have a listing um, in Granada Hills and we got six offers. So it's like, uh, the, the, it really comes down to supply and demand and what's going to cause that supply to grow, right? We are seeing days on market go up. We're at 22 days on average, which is a long time when you look at it from the perspective of the last couple of years years when the days on market was like seven or like a day. Um, but the biggest metric I like to look at is the month supply. So the month supply is if no new homes came to the market, how many months would it take for all the inventory to be gone? So in this case, we're at 2.6 months. So if no new homes came to the market, it would take um, under three months for all homes to sell. That's still considered to be a seller's market. Anything below six months is a seller's market. Anything above is a buyer's market. Um, a great example is during COVID, like legitimate quarantine, the month supply in downtown LA was as much as like nine months. Like there was just tons of inventory out there. 2.6, yes, it's on the, it's it's actually been flat. I'm looking at the data right now over the last couple of months. But if you can compare it to a year ago, so this is November data. If you compare it to even let's say January of last year, it was at like 2.5 months. It actually hasn't fluctuated that much on average, right? Yes, it's gone down, it's gone up. We really won't know for another couple months. But what we're seeing is we're seeing this clash, right? So we have buyers on one hand who are saying, there's a pending recession, I want a deal. But then you have sellers who are like, well, if you really believe there was a recession, why are you even bothering to buy? And by the way, I've locked in a really low interest rate, so I can hold out. And then we're seeing this clash. Right. I mean, I've written offers for clients and the sellers are like, yeah, we're willing to hold out. We're willing to rent it out. Right. Because rents, they're down a little bit because of seasonality. But in general, rents, in my opinion, are going to skyrocket over the next couple of years. I just inventory just keeps going down. Um, L.A. keeps imposing more and more rent control, rent restrictions, which pushes all the mom and pop landlords out. So that keeps inventory low. Um and so that's really what we're seeing, right? There's no more land to build. You still cannot build affordable housing. So my guess, and based off some of the data, is similar to what John's saying. I think this is going to be a more of a level out. I think we, we are seeing it decrease. It's right now the average sales um, to list price is 97.5%. So people are no longer on average getting over asking. That is, that is happening. But as we continue on, we just have to have those conversations with sellers and be like, hey, look, you got to be more realistic on your list price. Or in some cases, we're going to price it artificially low. I did that for one of my listings in Tarzana. We priced it high, didn't get it. So we priced it artificially low and we're in escrow for 21000 above list. Well, can I, can I interject? I have actually a, a quick question on that. Go for I'm it. getting excited about it. So I, I'm one of those, those people who fought like not every day, but every so often, maybe a few times a week. I'll check Redfin just to see what's in the area because my wife and I were hopefully going to buy within the next year or so. And I noticed that 
a house will be listed, let's say it's like 800,000, like a condo, $800,000. And then a few weeks later, now it's instead of 800, it's 750,000. So I don't know if that's, so I guess my follow-up to that is it's interesting that you say very clever that you actually listed a little bit below. So then you end up getting higher rather than having to keep stepping down the asking mm -hmm. price. So I, I was wondering like, if that's very common to see, like basically the listings just, you know, being re what's the, I don't know the exact verbiage, basically like being relisted or, or how's it like price reduction? Yeah. So, I mean, you have two options when you list a property with three options, right? You can, let's say that the, the value is a million to make it. So you can list it at a million and just say, this is my price moving on. You can price it high and you might get it, but the idea is some buyer may feel like they're the world's greatest negotiator. I've actually done that before. I was representing a seller off market and the buyer, and I knew the buyer that wanted it. I'm like, he's, he's going to try to negotiate. So let's just list it hundred grand higher, right? It's off market. <laughs> no kidding. Because he got burned on another property, he paid full price. Wow. <laughs> so I'm like, I got an extra hundred grand. I uh, love that. But it's painful to if it doesn't sell to constantly do those price reductions. So, you know, to, to your point, Michael, in a few months, this data may be totally different, right? This data is as of the last three months and a lot's happened. The, the data may be very different where the average price at selling might be less. It might be much, much less in less price um, in compared to the sales price. Um, but then alternatively, you could price it art, what I call artificially low, right? So if it was, uh, listed for a million, do you price it at 975? Do you price it at 950? And in the hopes to get multiple offers. Sometimes it works. Um, right now, what we're seeing is buyers are pushing back. So they're like, I get it. You price it artificially low. I just don't feel comfortable paying 50 grand over. I might pay five grand over, 10 grand over. Um, if they're offering 50 grand over, it's because there's a certain caveat, right? Oh, I'm willing to pay 50 grand over because I need to sell my other property. Or I'm, you know, not the most qualified, but we want you to take a chance. And I'm willing to pay a price for that. So that that's what's so interesting about this data is like, honestly, this data is somewhat useless because we really don't know what's going to happen over the next three months. Now that the interest rates somewhat have stabilized, yes, they're expected to go up, but now that expectation has been set. But we still have buyers that are having babies that are getting divorced that are downsizing because yep. their kids are going off to college. We're now at that phase or starting to get to that phase where people are moving, buying something because they have to, not because they want to, right? My house, I always use my house as an example. We have a three bedroom house and an ADU. Really, we want a four bedroom house. It's cheaper just to not rent out my ADU <laughs> and use that as a fourth bedroom. It would be cheaper for me just to do an addition and add a fourth bedroom than it is to move. And we're not the only ones who have the same thought. So that's what's going to keep inventory low going forward. It's like, you know, sellers are going to have to really think long and hard if they really want to sell. And that makes it challenging for buyers. Right? If they're coming from a place of renting, yeah. they need to buy, but there aren't that many options out there. So that's kind of what's going on, at least on on my real estate end. So I'm just trying to coach my clients, my buyers, I'm coaching the same as I was before. I never told them, Hey, you need to offer $200,000 more. I always say, look, you offer what you feel comfortable with. Cause at the end of the day, you're the one making the payments. You're the one paying the utilities. You're the one living there. Last thing I want is for you to regret. But then for sellers, it's the conversations I'm having are, what are you going to do with the money? Like, do you really need to sell? And mm -hmm. Hey, Yes, I understand your neighbor So, Like I have a listing coming up where it was a condo complex. The neighbor, literally right next door, sold for $642,000. Now, it's slightly nicer. I'll give them that. So my client's like, okay, well, I should get close to that price. I'm like, you need a list at five ninety nine. dollars That's just where we're at. And let's, let's go from there. So that kind of goes into that. Do you guys have any questions for me? Otherwise, we'll go into Michael. No. You, it's yeah, you, you hit it on the head actually. I didn't even consider, no, yeah, it's a really fair point. Just doing an addition to the home rather than moving to buy a home or moving 
to a home that has that extra bedroom. That's actually a fair point. I didn't even, I did not even consider that. Yeah. The down payment I could use and build out another bedroom and bathroom if I really wanted to. And I could do a HELOC, right? A home equity line of credit. I could finance that. And I'm still have my 2.875% interest rate on my first. And then I can just pay off the, the HELOC whenever I want. And the, as John likes to call it, the blended rate will still be lower than if I were to buy a whole new place. So the only reason why someone would want to move in like my situation would be if we want to move to a different location altogether. So that kind of goes into that. So okay. now that we've talked um, a little bit about the housing market, let's talk about personal finance. And that's where Michael comes in. What have you seen over Woo-hoo. the last quarter? Yeah. Yeah, it was John's idea to invite you. Yeah. So well done. It was a great idea. So let's go ahead and talk. Michael, yeah. what, are, what are we seeing? Um, I mean, first and foremost, you know, the stock market is on every everybody's mind, you know, and when you start hearing it over the news, people who hadn't, who typically will check their 401k balance once a year, they now check it at least once a month or, you know, every every paycheck, let's say. Um, it's been a really tough year. I know, John, you mentioned, you know, inflation, things like that as well. I mean, it's been a lot more volatile this year, meaning the stock market was down like roughly 20% twice this year. I think it got down, the overall stock market was down close to 25% earlier. It, we're, ru- we're roughly down 17% for the year, last I checked, which is good for people who have a lot more cash flow. They can just keep dollar cost averaging into the market, just, you know, buying at discounts. However, when the market is down now, and you also have the bond market down as well, because as John mentioned, interest rates have just been going up, up, up very steeply. So now you have bonds going down, stock market going down. So where do you put your money? That's like the million dollar question. Where do you put it? Because traditionally you had a 60, 40 portfolio, meaning 60% invested in the stock market, 40% 40% invested in bonds. Well, if, if, so let's say you have an old bond that's paying you one and a half percent, Rick, but now I can go out and purchase one at, I don't know, let's say 3% double. Why am I going to buy your bond from you when I can buy a brand new fresh one that's paying me 3%? So therefore, Rick, your bond is now worth a lot less for it to be worth, you know, the squeeze. So that's, that's the big, the big idea. Um, that, that's the big thing I've seen. So that's a, an ongoing conversation with clients. Where, where do we put the money? Do we hold, do we just sit tight? So that's kind of there in the overall stock market. Um, I've seen, I know, I think John, you mentioned also like with, so the other thing too is um, like you mentioned, John, 7.7% inflation. It is, it has come down a little bit. So interest rates will be, continue will continue to rise roughly like although like what john you said half a percent and then i'm not sure maybe it'll be still half a percent maybe only a quarter percent we don't know exactly but the idea is we want to get the long-term inflation down to a long-term average of two percent until that happens they're probably going to keep interest rates very high and we don't know exactly how long that'll take. The somewhat of good news that came out last month, I believe it was a little, it was, let me see, I think the number actually just had it up in front of me. So for the job openings, because essentially, if you guys followed the stock market last week, it was announced that it would be, the interest rates would be raised by half a percent rather than 75 basis points, 0.75%. So the stock market went wild, everybody loved it. But then they come out saying, oh, no, job growth is still pretty good. So what does that mean for inflation? No one knows. However, I will say that um, job openings fell 353,000, I think was the number, which is good, but it's not coming down fast enough because they want the job, basically, they want the job openings to fall further and further because that will slow the wage growth, which in turn should hopefully uh, slow inflation. So very long winded answer, but I wanted to, to get as much out there as possible. So I don't know if you have specific questions on that. Um, the question I have is, 
if I'm a millennial, why am I checking my 401k every month and being depressed? Like I can't like on a practical way, I can't do anything with that information. Oh yeah. So no, exactly. And it's more, so like I said, I want to say probably 85 to 90% of my clients fall within the millennial like definition. So like thirties, maybe early forties, mm-hmm. I'm telling them j- just to keep buying more. If, they have enough cash on the sidelines as an emergency fund. If not, now is the time because people are worried, is, are we in a recession? Will it get worse? Is there a recession coming? So I prioritize getting their emergency fund set up more than I am investing that 401k. But you're exactly right, Rick. It sucks seeing your balance go down right. in the 401k. But same as real estate, if you're a real estate investor, you're home, like you're in it for the long, the long, Right. Call. It's a long play. So I'm okay. But then like, here's the thing. I'm, I'm in the finance realm. So I'm, it sucks seeing the balance go down. But then on the flip side, I'm actually excited about it because I know I can sort of buy in cheap at a discount more or less in the stock market. So it, it's more of a psyche thing rather than, and yeah, it, but I, I noticed too with the retirement accounts, it's less of a pain to see it down. What I've seen are those investment accounts that are not specifically earmarked towards retirement or are not in a retirement account like an IRA, 401k, 402b, things like that, because if you actually wanted to, you could take that money. You know, it's more liquid of an investment because you're not necessarily paying penalties or fees to take take that money out. So it's like, ah, the money I now had access to quickly on hand is now worth, you know, 20, 30% less. So that could be a part of it as well. So really the big thing is, especially going into 2023, which we'll touch on, is like, we don't want to be stuck in analysis paralysis. <laughs> like we need to make moves. Right. Right. Because you're right. There's people over the last couple of years, I've seen it where they're like, I don't want to buy yet. I want to see what happens. I'm like, really? You want to see what happens? And it's like, well, here's what happened. Your interest rate just tripled for the same house. Yep. Yep. And values <laughs> did not go down. So yep. you just paid more. Because of your freak out. Yeah. And, you know, to both your guys' points, like, um, you know, Mike, you kind of touched on this was, you know, when a client asks, like, is this, is this a good time to buy? My, my answer is it's always a better time to buy now than later, just because people who do this for a living on Wall Street, the Fed, they got it wrong for two years. They said inflation was going to be transitory over COVID. They completely yeah, yeah. got it wrong. And everybody's beating them up before. That's, right. That's why you're seeing these, um, you know, these rates being raised, um, bank to bank rates, and we're kind of seeing no end in sight. And it's getting a little better, but it's kind of a little too late. So even the people who are Harvard graduates and, you know, MBA finances, University of Chicago, they're not getting it right. I know I'm not that smart, and I'm probably gonna get it wrong. So. My answer is always, it's always better to buy now because you can always refinance later too if the rates do go down. But um, like you said, the home prices are just going to keep going up, especially in LA. Um, It's just a question of magnitude. It's a question of what's the slope of increase. Um, And and that's what it really comes down to is um, timing the market, I think, is always a bad idea because even the smartest people in the world get it wrong. And uh, nobody yeah. saw uh, these things coming. And I think uh, Michael and I have actually had a side conversation about this. To, you're better off investing stocks, whatever, no matter what, for two reasons. One, because we're all going to die at the same time, <laughs> right? So the longer you wait, the worse financially you're going to be. But especially for the millennial generation, which is a major generation, right? They're in some of their peak um, income producing years. We're in our 30s. If we're if our goal is to retire by our 60s, we're already halfway done with our working years. So you have to think about where are we today and are we where we need to be? And a cloud just went right over my property. <laughs> like that was like horrible timing of like it's dire, and then like the cloud comes over. Um, so uh, but yeah, I mean, I think. Yeah, I mean, we we started doing that. We, we maxed out my wife's four hundred one k, all that because it's like we need to set ourselves up. I don't care what's going on in the world right now. If my goal is to retire or my goal is to be set up, 
by the time we're our parents' age or younger, it's like, we have to make moves now. So th thank you for that. So let's kind of go into, and this is where our worlds blend, right? From the finance perspective and real estate perspective. If you're a seller, right? Like I'm talking to people who are thinking about selling. What are things that they need to be thinking about going into 2023, right? So let's talk from a personal finance perspective. Michael, if one of your clients says, Michael, I'm thinking about selling right now. What are the conversations you're having? The, the first thing I, I, I try to ask as nicely as possible is, you know, sort of like, what's your plan? Like, what, not necessarily why, but okay, once you sell, what are you going to do? It's actually, Rick, like you mentioned earlier, you hit it on the head with your, does it make sense to purchase a new home? Because now interest rates are a lot higher. So your monthly payment will absolutely be higher if you were lucky enough to get something in twos, threes, even fours, 4%. So it's my always, my thing is, where are you going to go? Because mm -hmm. if you have a legit, and you know, it might be one of those things where, yeah, they are in a two bedroom apartment or condo and they have to upgrade they have no choice because they have one or two kids now they can't just you know it's not ideal let's say to, to squeeze them in a two-bedroom condo so it's more so planning for it and also like where you're going to go the other thing i'll say is like i love what you said rick about does it make sense just to put that money to like an adu building an adu or adding a room to the actual home but I would say my biggest thing too is if you're moving, you want to keep, especially now, keep enough cash on the side for for basically to like, like I guess this comes to the buying side too, which I guess we might talk about later. But like, there might be things that you need to fix in the new house that you purchase as well. You know, just things will come up, so just not overextending. You know, I don't know if that was. No, that's a fair point. So if you're going to sell, yeah. sell, let's say you net $100,000, you're saying, because typically what people do is they sell their place and then they use 100% of the net proceeds to go buy the next place. You're saying, don't do that. Maybe take 80% of that towards buying the new place and keep that 20% as reserves because there's going to be repairs that are going to come up or just having savings in general. Did that, does that right. sound about right? Yeah, essentially. I mean, yeah, it's also too, it's like, like we said, it's, it, uh, you might not, it might not actually be the best time to sell if you have nowhere else to go. Like if you can't make the numbers work financially from a mortgage standpoint. Um, so it's, it's basically, I always run the numbers from a cash flow perspective with my clients. Like, can you afford, like, yeah, it might not be ideal to spend another $1,500, $2,000 a month in housing costs, but if you can actually afford it, then fine, let's do it. But right. that's my first question I ask is what what's your plan and what's what's your reasoning behind wanting to move? Like, are there other solutions where we can possibly wait things out? And it might not be that you can wait something out, but um, it, it is a common thing where they say, um, OK, yeah, it like also with we're talking about real estate, but also with the, the used car market was super sure. crazy um, a while a little while back. So it's one of those things. OK, you sell your car. Heck, yeah. You know, Kelly Blue Book. Uh, CarMax, whatever, they just gave me a huge check. Okay, well, now I'm in the same exact position because now to buy a new <laughs> a new used car, it's going to be the same price, if not more. So it's kind of just right. like transferring the, the equity from one property to another. So you just got to make sure the numbers make sense before you just jump on it. No, that, that's that's a fair point. I think that was part of the, with the issue with the car uh, used car market was people like myself, we had a lease and the lease was up. And so we we're yeah, it's kind of tied to housing. You have to be forced to sell is where I think we're going to start heading into 2023. Yep. John, from a, from a mortgage perspective, what are sellers, what are things that sellers have to think about? You know, I, I think that um, sellers, uh, they probably have to in this market, you know, just, you know, today, like I can't say what's going to happen in the future, but sure. um, they're going to, you know, they are working with buyers in terms of these buy downs and things like that. They realize um, that, you know, buyers are constrained at this point, you know, the realism, um, factor has to come into play and the gap between what buyers want to pay and what sellers want to get has to close, um, your, you know, expectations and, you know, you know, Rick, you're a great agent. You set those expectations and tell them, Hey, listen, 
go for 599 because this is what it's worth and nobody's going to pay for this because of the rate um that we are in today so um and then michael to your point about netting you know if let's, let's say you net like 250 from the sell your house and you have to purchase another one um you know in, in making the financials work and maybe you only spend 200 of the 250 or maybe you put all 250 in and then you just buy a cheaper house so then your pity is much 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 smaller because you're borrowing much 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 less um it could go you know e either one of those strategies could work or you know you put that 50k into you know an investment vehicle something you know mike can help out with but um i would say for the most part what i see uh is you know you know it's it's kind of a strange time like overextending yourself and buying a 1.1 million dollar home versus a 900 thousand dollar home um you know could put you in a financially safer situation just in case and you know nobody wants to overextend themselves or you know be house poor um and you know there's all kinds of different strategies that can be done and those conversations just need to be honest and open and you know uh, realistic. I think that's really the question is realism is really the key here is just to hold out, just to hold out for no, like I need to make this number work. Um, I, I think that's rarely, uh, you know, it's like, it's like talks with North Korea, right? When you don't have any conversation, it's probably going to go nowhere. <laughs> yeah. I, I think that's kind of the big thing is, I mean, I remember I had a listing last year, told my clients to list it for 999. They really wanted 1.1 1 .1 million. I'm like, why would your house sell for 1.1 million when this one other house sold for less and had a pool and you didn't? Well, that's the number I want. I'm like, fine. Well, we got over asking. <laughs> like, <laughs> we, I was like, holy shit. Um, it was, and we only got one offer, but hey, it was it was over asking, no appraisal contingency. We got it to appraise, but still, um, nowadays you do have to be more realistic. We have to be more conservative. Um, I'm meeting more and more sellers that have tenants in place and their tenants aren't necessarily paying rent. They just want out. So I have to have that honest conversation. Look, right now they're basically unsellable unless you're willing to give a massive discount for someone to inherit that problem. You're paying. That's really what it comes down to is you know, you're paying for those problems. You know, when I bought my properties out of state, we're inheriting certain issues, but that's how you get the price down. Um, so when you're selling, it's, I, I agree with both of you. I think you have to have an, a clear idea of where you're going to go. Like you can't just be like, I'll figure it out, you know, or um, I'm talking to some people next month where they're like, we want to sell our place. They're in a condo. So they need to get bigger, but like, all right, maybe we'll go, we'll rent for a year and see what happens. It's like, it doesn't work that way. Right. Cause you could be spending 60 grand a year in rent. And you may not have had anything and you just ate up a huge chunk of your net proceeds. So that you're better off having a plan up front. What I'm telling most sellers, um, if they were like actually living in their house to actually buy something else, don't necessarily go from selling your place to go to a place of renting, unless you're moving out of the area, right? Like if you're moving out of state, you might be like, okay, I need to explore the neighborhoods. I don't want to jump into a property and be totally screwed. That I get. But if we're talking um, moving up or even downsizing, but you're staying in Los Angeles, Ventura County, wherever, wherever you live, um, you're better off doing that type of move. So um, anything else we should touch on for sellers before we switch over to buyers, which I know we tend to work more with? Yeah, I, I will say. So I like that you said that too. And I've noticed, and we've all talked about, so we've been... I've had more creative conversations and John also talked about risk being risk averse and versus, you mm -hmm. know, being more risk tolerant. So one of the things I like to tell my clients for first time home buyers, at least is not to go crazy and put more than 20% of cash into a property. Because for me personally, I feel like I, that's just too much cash to be in one single investment. That's kind of how I view it. However, recently I had conversations with a client of mine who was looking to move. So over time, he now ended up having, I think it was like maybe 40% equity in his home over the years. Great. So what we wanted to do is purchase a house. So in order to keep, and he was considering, hey, do I take a cash out refi? So now I only keep 20% equity. Or do I take that same dollar amount that was in my one property and just plop it into 
the new property. It'll still be, it was roughly the same price because they're moving for like school districts. So I said, you know what? Yeah, you already have 40% equity in your current home. What there won't be much change financially for you or where your money is located if you just take that same $40,000, apply it to your new, your new home. And then the payments will, they weren't roughly the same, obviously, because interest rates are higher. But that's one thing we considered as well. So it's just more creative conversations I've found when it comes to that, that aspect of it. Yeah, I agree. So let's hop into buyers and then we can even do a little bit on the investment side. But what should buyers be doing going into 2023? Because they're the ones really who are probably affected the most by all of this, right? They're the ones who are affected by the interest oh, yeah. rates. They're the ones that are growing families, right? Millennials, they're getting married, they're having kids, whatever, but they're coming from a place of renting. So they're the ones we really have to watch out for. So um, we'll start this time with John. Um, what should they be planning for going into 2023? Um, so I think that, you know, for planning purposes, the people who have to plan the earliest and the most are self-employed. And self-employed is because um, their taxes are going to be due in April. And CPAs are just deal killers. Like their goal is completely opposite of a loan officer's goal. Right. Their goal is to show as little income as possible so that you don't have a tax liability. And our goal is to show maximum income as possible so that your loan goes through super easy and we can prove that you can afford any payment, right? Um, so having a conversation with the CPA if you're self-employed and say, hey, listen, I need to um, not write off uh, you know, everything under the sun in order to show the income um, that we need to buy a home that I want at the $1 million range or something like that. Um, they can even send drafts to us first and we can say, Hey, if this is the, if this is the, the tax return that you want to, uh, submit, this is what you'll be a pre-approved for. Um, that's kind of the biggest thing. Um, for, for salary W2, usually income is kind of one of those things where, um, if you're going to get a raise, like in January, best to wait till January, uh, to, to finalize that income so that we give you one shot, you know, one blast. Hey, this is the pre-approval amount. Um, it's probably not good to do, Hey, I'm expected to have an income of X because if the expected is any different from the reality, that pre-approval number will change. Right. Um, and it's best to do it in a snapshot in time at the rate that's prevalent at the time. Uh, so, you know, that number doesn't fluctuate. Like I said, in prior situations, especially this year, you know, people who are pre approved in January are going to be pre approved for much less. Everything else given the same just because of interest rates today. Um, that's kind of what I would say. Um, and then also, if you have, you know, for down payment and closing costs and all those things, if you're moving a lot of money, um, just make sure you do that kind of now, um, if that's the case. Um, and then have that conversation early and say, hey, you know, I'll be taking from my 401k or, you know, I'll be taking from my investment and then putting that money into into the down payment. The less transaction movements that happen will make your escrow a lot easier. Um, at maximum, um, lenders will gather two months of bank statements. So anything that happens prior to those two months, nobody ever sees. Um, and it's just a lot cleaner, a lot easier for everyone involved if the money is there in place, already done, and then um, you know we just move forward with that. The more movements, lenders are you know, required to trace all those things if it's a large sum of money. Got it. Okay, Michael, what are your two cents? So two cents. Um, uh, for buyers like going into 2023. Yeah, yeah. I, I feel like I'm obligated to say this just to not overspend. <laughs> <laughs> like I, my, my, so for example, I know, um, at least being in LA, a lot of people are trying to, I've seen trying to stretch the down payment and get as much as they can. So one thing, so at least now it's a little bit more concerning just with the whole like recession talk looming overhead. I mean, I'm a little bit more optimistic than pessimistic, but it's just a matter how you plan. So mm -hmm. like, let's say you have your down payment fund and then six months worth of savings. I would avoid as much as you can dipping into that emergency fund because that's what it's there for. And there might be added expenses coming up that you do not even account for. So I wouldn't, so if you're in a position where you have to take all the cash you have and now you're left with one, two months worth of expenses, that's a big no. It's like that, that would be like, 
I don't know if it's a red flag per se, but that's basically, I would say, but that's not the deal for you. So that's, that's my number one thing I would say. Um, and I know I mentioned the whole 20% down into a property. I probably wouldn't go more than 20%. I don't know how, how you both feel about that. I mean, it just depends on how you want the numbers to work, but that's me from, that's my uh, risk aversion in that aspect. And then I will say to people who we've talked about it before, if people are worried about you know, oh, they, they're going to get a crap deal because the housing market, you know, you're going to get a better deal next year. So what? You know, it's the same as the stock market. It's volatile. Um, if you're going to be having a property 5, 10, 15, 20, 30 years plus, you're looking back, you're not going to care that it dips, you know, 10% or whatever the number is. So right. those are my few points that I would say. Yeah, um, there's a couple things I always touch on with people. So first of all, when you get pre-approved is always based off gross income, not net. Sure. So there's a, what's called debt to income ratio. So they take your monthly debt based off your monthly income. And that's something that you really have to take a look at because let's say you make 60 grand a year, that's five grand a month, but you're not bringing home $5,000 a month. You're bringing home significantly less, especially if you're putting money to a 401k and all that. So going into 2023, you know, we're not seeing the prices drop enough to con um, to compensate for the interest rates. So you really have to take a look at that. The other thing to factor in, um, and we didn't get a chance to touch on it, but the loan limits are going up. You can buy now a $1.1 million house with an FHA loan. That's insane. Insane, right? <laughs> it's totally insane. But like, I get it. And what's, what actually is great about that is I have a lot of clients who want to buy properties with um, accessory dwelling units because they want to rent it out. Now we're starting to get to that price point where there are homes in, for that price range and they can actually do an FHA loan. So that part's actually kind of cool. They're, it's making it easier for house hackers to kind of jump into it. Um, but I, I agree. It's like if property values drop, so what? Um, it's still better than the alternative, which is renting. Right. So let's say let's say the market crashes by 10 percent or let's uh, that's unrealistic. Let's say it was 5 percent over the next year. Right. So on a million dollar purchase, that's like 50 grand. If you spent 50 grand in rent over that past year, which isn't going to be that unheard of with how high rents are, it's a you're actually it's it's a wash or worse because you didn't get the, the loan buy down. You didn't get the tax benefits. So there's still all these other reasons to buy other than just, I want um, my value to go up. It's rents are expected to continue to climb, but your mortgage is fixed. That, that's exactly right. I'm just going to hop. I literally had this conversation <laughs> yesterday evening with a client of mine. And I, it was one of those things, rents will, can continue to go up. However, if you have a fixed mortgage, your rate is pretty your monthly payment's not going to go up aside from, you know, slight property tax increases, or maybe you have an HOA that might go up, but otherwise it's not going to be increasing nearly as much as rent will. Yeah. So and, and, funny you say that. Yeah. So, and then, you know, on the investor side, cause there are investors buying, it's like, you should still buy, but you know, oftentimes LA you bank on appreciation, not cash flow. Yeah. And so some people are willing to take a small loss on the rents. If they know that rents can go up nowadays, if you're house hacking, right, you're living there. Yeah, sure. Take the risk because you're, you have to have a roof over your head anyways. But if you're looking at it as a straight investment, right, I actually probably would be on the more conservative side. It's like, no, it, it needs to cash flow today. Even if it's not much, I just don't want to be putting any more money into it. That you know, Because if really the concern with that is if there, this recession, which it feels like we're forcing ourselves into the recession, maybe that's just me. But you have all these tech companies that are laying people off when they don't have to. They're just doing it in preparation. It's like, well, you're forcing this to happen. Um, that's going to affect our tenants, right? I mean, that's they, they lose their jobs. They can't pay rent. So those are things that we do have to look out for. Um, but, and, you know, it's expensive to buy an investment property. As John will tell you, it's a higher interest rate. You got to pay points, all of that. So if you're going to do it, do it right. Um, if I had tons of money in the bank and I really wanted to invest, I honestly would probably be investing in Ventura County, um, maybe Riverside County, maybe a little bit Orange County. Um, LA County is becoming more and more tenant friendly. 
um, or I really should say anti-landlord. That's really what it is. You know, there's the eviction moratorium that's supposed to be up, but then I've heard it's been extended. Um, and it's just one of those things where it's just, it's a business decision at this point, right? If I'm going to invest $250,000 on, on a million dollar property, I have to make sure that my, my assets are protected. Just like people would be pissed if something would happen in their stock market, right? If they're 401ks, whatever. So that's kind of what we're seeing. Um, any last minute personal finance tips from either of you? It can be from any perspective before we wrap this up. This has been a really good talk, by the way. I really appreciate it. Oh, yeah. No, I'm, I'm, I'm tapped oh. out. I think, I think we covered it all. I like it. Exactly. Yeah. No, I, yeah. I, I think, I think we said a lot. I mean, I don't want to just, you know, be a dead horse, but yeah, whatever. <laughs> the last, the, the whole, the whole conversation was great. I felt like the, the interest rates, inflation, it all blends, you know, with real estate, investing, personal finance. So it's a really good talk. I, I really appreciate being here. Thank you. Of course. Appreciate the opportunity. And really, um, I think in summary, it's, you got to make moves in 2023. doesn't matter what it is. You just got to do something. So, uh, Michael, how can people get a hold of you? So people can get a hold of me probably the two easiest ways, either uh, email Michael at from planning to living dot com. I do have an Instagram page. Uh, it's at Michael Izbotsky. So those are probably the two two uh, easiest ways if you want to just shoot me a message that way. Great. John? Um, I'm pretty easy. John dot Kim at rate dot com, and then I'm always available by cell phone as well. Eight one eight eight uh four eight zero nine three six nine. Great. If anyone wants to get a hold of me, call, text, whatever three two three nine two nine seven six five three. But I'm also on Instagram and other social media platforms at at Rick B Albert. All right, gentlemen. Well, thank you so much, and I look forward to doing this again. We'll see how the next quarter turns out. Thanks, Rick. Good. Thanks, Rick. Thank you.